Good evening. Grace and peace to you from God and our Lord Jesus Christ. And welcome to the Reformed Church of Bronxville for this very special and very important conversation. My name is Matt Waterstone. I have the privilege of serving as the senior minister here at the Reformed Church. I'm so grateful for the gift of your time and presence and also grateful for the gift of time for those that are watching via live stream. Before we get going, just a few housekeeping details. As it relates to our COVID guidelines, if you are not vaccinated, we would humbly request that you remain masked the entire time. However, if you are vaccinated, wearing a mask is optional and to your discretion. Uh, if you do need to use a washroom, there is a bathroom in the back and there are also bathrooms off to the side, up the stairs, both men's and women's bathrooms are there. Uh, before we get going, I, I just would like to, especially on the church's side, offer a word of appreciation to Kate Milliken Voy, who is not only a member of the Counseling Center Board, but also is a member of the Governing Board, the Consistory, here at the Reformed Church of Bronxville. Kate serves as a deacon. We are so delighted uh, for Kate's leadership in this most important area. So again, on behalf of the church, we're so, so grateful for the gift to be able to have this really important conversation. I'm gonna pass it off to my colleague, Sam. Thanks, Matt. Again, welcome. My name is Sam Clover. I'm an associate minister here at the church. And it is such a pleasure and a privilege to be in partnership with the Counseling Center to do this program tonight. Um, when Kate and the Counseling Center approached Matt and me about doing something about mental health, we thought uh, that is so important for us to be talking about, especially in a time of COVID, when many of us have felt anxiety, depression, and many of whom we love have felt those things too. It's very human and natural. And we want to destigmatize that. Um, speaking to you as a minister and a human being, I can tell you that throughout my life, I have benefited from psychotherapy. Uh, and even now, uh, I see a therapist every week. And in fact, as long as I'm in a helping position, profession, whether it's the ministry or something else, I plan on keeping that therapeutic relationship because I think it keeps me grounded. And it's also been significant for me on my spiritual journey. So I pray uh, whatever your belief system or an ecumenical group tonight that this will benefit you. Um, and I'd like to invite you to join me in just a word of prayer before we get going. Will you pray with me? Oh God, the author of Psalm 139 said, I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Help us all to know and to truly believe that we are all fearfully and wonderfully made in your image and that you want for each of us perfect shalom, peace and wholeness. God, I thank you for these good friends, for S.E. and Olivia and Jen and Virgil and Kate and their willingness to share so openly about their journeys. May we all learn something new tonight about each other and about ourselves. Amen. And now I turn it over to Kate Milligan Boy. Thank you so much, Sam, for your transparency and for everyone being here. Um, we are actually recording this event, and so uh, we will be having a dialogue, and then we're going to open it up for questions. Um, if someone is uncomfortable being recorded, it would be great just to not stand up and ask a question. So, <laughs> never have we been more aware of mental health issues in this time of COVID. Um, it has been estimated that 51 and a half million adults in the United States are dealing with the mental health challenge, and that was before COVID. Since then, the CDC has put out a report that actually has kicked up that number. 51 and a half million adults is one in five, adults in the U.S., and now we are up to two in five of adults who are dealing with depression and anxiety and trauma. We're seeing more adults in emergency rooms and more kids are receiving services. There are 16 percent of children from the ages of 6 to 17 who are dealing with a mental health challenge. So I want to dive into this conversation um, with the shared experience we've all had, which is with COVID. And Virgil, I'm going to start with you. 
um, as the director of the counseling center, you have had nine therapists in the mix um, who are busy anyway. I'm curious for you to talk a, a little bit about your perspective of COVID in terms of what you witnessed. Well, with all of that data that you just shared, I think the essence of that is everyone felt out of control. And I would not say that everybody's experience was the same, but I think the essence of everyone feeling somewhat out of control was there. So we had people that would come to us from after the COVID started in uh, March 16, 2020, when we shut down to see in person. And then we had people that left us and didn't come back and now are starting to come back mm. because the sense of being so out of control, whether it was their finances or what it exposed, whether it was their relationship in their marriages or their significant uh, uh, relationships with others, everything became more heightened. Now, the other piece of it, though, is it also opened up a deeper way to deal with some anxiety and depression or trauma that maybe had lying, you know, lay dormant for a long time. And that's where I think that we as therapists have really found this has been, a, has been a very rich time, albeit a challenging time for those people that we work with. Recognizing that everybody is on an individual path dealing with their own you know, world. Um, Jen, is there anybody, would you say, demographically that suffered more than others? Right. Well, first and foremost, and I'm sure this isn't a surprise, that anyone who actually battled with the virus in some real way has been the most, you know, those people have been the most impacted, right? So if you've been sick, if you've had loss, um, doctors, nurses, first responders, um, you know, I think there's trauma, actually. Um, and, and we know that from the beginning. I mean, you know, an ER doctor committing suicide. I mean, things like that happened. Um, then from there, I think of it sort of as a chronological arc um, in the beginning of the pandemic, before we knew how the virus was transmitted, um, we were all hunkered down, you know, scared, our, our lives were changing, um, but we were isolated. Um, and therefore, the elderly um, and people who lived alone, I think, suffered the most in the beginning, um, with the possible addition of teens and young adults. Um, because their lives sort of really went on hold. Teens and young adults have developmental needs to be social, to be out of their houses, <laughs> to be with their friends. Um, I'm sure this sounds familiar to a lot of people sitting here, you know, if you have teens and, and young adult children. Um, and so, yeah, and, and as you were saying, you know, there's been an uptick in mental health crises for that age group, suicidality, in that age group is up. Um, yeah, and then um, I think in the tail end of the pandemic, so where we are now, um, young parents, you know, because once most of the population could get vaccinated, it's sort of left behind small children. Mm -hmm. um, and so the parents mm -hmm. of those children, I think have something I've identified as adjustment fatigue. Mm -hmm. Like we've just had to keep, and they've had to just keep changing and changing and changing based on what the CDC said or school district said. Um, so there's been sort of like an arc, I think. To and then in some less. ways it's worse that when parents, you know, the world is beginning to move forward and there's still a young contingency not getting vaccinated exactly. of having to kind of have to hold back. Yeah. I think the world has certainly um, been confusing with uh, COVID, but I think one could argue it got a little bit confusing before that with the state of national politics. And there are few people on this earth that have had a more interesting perspective on that than Essie Cup. <laughs> so Essie, hi. hi. Thank you, thank you for being here. Thanks for having us. Um, what would you say had been different for you in the past couple years professionally as compared to the rest of your career? Well, the last few years were abnormal. Um, you know, we as journalists, and especially in politics, wrestled with how to cover the abnormality of politics. Whatever side you were on, um, tensions were heightened, emotions were raw. You had um, a very disorienting shift in politics coupled with um, a bunch of cultural crises, racial crises, and um, class issues all coming to a head at the same time. 
And I know how I felt covering it. Like I didn't know anything anymore. The parties I thought I had known, yeah. the political contours I thought I had known, the people I thought I had known, um, that all shifted. And I imagine a lot of people outside of politics watching it felt the same. Yeah. And then you had COVID. Right. And so this was a lot, a lot going on um, at once and compounding over, over time. And as a journalist, I mean, we cover the worst, right? We, we cover war, we cover genocide, we cover national disasters. We, we go with it. Um, we are quote unquote trained for these highs and lows. And I thought I was mastering it and doing okay. Right. And on some level when kind of, you know, it all began kind of changing that there was something novel about it, right? They're like, ooh, this is a little different. Um, there was, I mean, sure. If you've been covering politics as long as I have, there is something exciting about it being different. Um, I didn't think that different was good, but it was different. Um, <laughs> it was different. Yes. And look, we all had to adjust to the new, the new White House, the new president, and how, how this was all going to operate differently than it had. Again, whatever side you're on, it was different. And so that was a huge, huge adjustment. The, the other thing, too, is you had known all these people in press um, that had been working with you for a long time, and it felt deeply personal on some level that people were taking different stances. So segue into how all of that began to affect you personally. Well, I mean, I, I, I don't want to get political here, so I won't. I'll speak very vaguely. But um, everything I thought I had known was suddenly kind of turned upside down. And the things I thought we all cared about, turns out very few people that I had been working with cared about that anymore. And so I was personally disoriented. And, you know, that was, that was hard for me. But again, I'm a journalist. We'll ro roll with it. And I'm, I'm covering this. And I'm on the front lines. And I'll, I'll figure it out. But I think I just kept compartmentalizing, which is what we do. We see awful things. I see video across my desk that's too graphic to ever make it to TV. But we have to filter that. We have to be the first people to look at that. And I just kept compartmentalizing it. And um, eventually, what my now therapist says um, happened is I OD'd. I OD'd on the images, the awfulness, the news, the social media, the roller coaster ride of politics, covering it all. COVID, what was going on with my kid in school, I OD'd. When you hear about compartmentalizing, can you guys relate to that in terms oh, of your clients? So what does that look like for you two? It's compartmentalizing is a coping mechanism, of course, and it's the only way sometimes whether kids know how to do it very well because if they've experienced a traumatic experience, if they don't find a way to shut that out and compartmentalize, they could really go bonkers, right? And this is why I think people had to find their own way to cope with this out of control situation. And we see that every day, every week with patients we work with because we don't judge that compartmentalizing. We understand it as a defense to cope. And if you understand it that way, there's nothing except compassion for what someone is dealing with. I think trauma, there's a wonderful video on YouTube called Wisdom of Trauma by Gab Gabor Mate. And he talks about our body holds that trauma. And sometimes if we don't recognize it and respect that, then what we're doing is we're pushing and making more traumatic experiences. Mm -hmm. So I honor the fact, as he, of how you might have had to cope, but you found some help in that. That's wonderful. You know, the topsy-turvy aspect that you're talking about was profound. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we all might have our compartments and we all might know our stressors. But when your world gets turned upside down and everything is topsy-turvy, um, you know, you're furloughed suddenly, yeah. right? <laughs> you can't go into work. Um, we had to figure out how to Zoom quickly, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. like really quickly. Mm -hmm. um, uh, our whole field of work transformed, mm -hmm. like overnight, you know? Yeah. Um, the compartments are a little more slippery. You don't know your own stressors anymore. They're brand new. Mm -hmm. And no one out there to really knew how to deal with them either. You know, we had to get educated quickly right. and deal with our own 
sort of responses to the stressors as well, but the compartments weren't as clear, yeah. I think, you know? Mm -hmm. Oh, and Olivia, now I want to hear about your compartments. <laughs> <laughs> that Let's sounds talk. dirty. I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Very exciting. Um, why don't we start? I know that you, you know, Essie has alluded to having some anxiety during this period. Yours yeah. happened earlier in your life. Oh yeah, I've been anxious way before COVID, so yeah. <laughs> but um, So tell me your story from kind of when that all started for you. Okay, well, I feel like I've always been a very anxious person in general, um, very nervous, very overthinking, but I think it kind of came over time, like realizing how bad it was, because when I was, when I was six years old or seven years old, like first grade, I was diagnosed with ADHD dash dyslexia. Well, dyslexia came a little later, but ADHD like at that time. And so I was like put on medication and stuff. And I was like medicated for a lot of elementary school. And I feel like when you're medicated at a young age, you kind of like, you don't really know yourself that well because mm -hmm. you have a medicine in you that's kind of altering it a little bit. And so I think, then I went to middle school at a place called Windward, which is in Westchester, which is like the best school ever. It's for people with learning disabilities. And I was not medicated when I was there. And I kind of like found myself a little bit more and like I was starting to like, like myself and even the anxiety and the ADHD and the dyslexia, which definitely all have something to do with each other. It's not one or the other, it's like a blender of Crap, sorry. <laughs> that but, sounds uh, like a delicious cocktail. Yeah, there it is. But, but anyway, um, I, then I went to Bronxville School, and you all know Bronxville School, and it's just not, um, the, it's not friendly for people who are like me, and that's okay, because you know, everyone has their own place in the world, but I think it kind of triggered my anxiety to be like, more than it used to be. And I started to like shield myself from like who I really was because of the surroundings and stuff and I started to become an anxious, more anxious person. I think when we spoke before, Olivia, you yeah. spoke about the fact you came into the Bronxville school in ninth grade. Yeah, freshman year, ninth and grade. And the story you told me, which I think is relevant, is that when you started the Bronxville school, you were put in a couple of regents classes. Oh, yeah. Which in the normal world are totally normal level classes. Yeah. But your perception or how you felt people were perceiving you yeah. was that you were I don't think it was a perception. <laughs> I think it, it's straight up like a real thing that Bronxville, when you're not academically like as successful as some other people at the school, and I don't think it's the people's fault though at all. Like I want to make that clear. Like I don't think it's the people's fault. I think it's just like systematic. You know, like a part of schooling systems is like making people who are a little different feel different and that really like puts a toll on a person and I think that like it's just um yeah that, that just like puts yeah and so oh so I was put into Regents classes sorry you can see the ADHD right now so I was put into Regents classes and I like didn't know really what that meant and so I had to go to something called um resource room which they have a different name for it now and I don't know what it is but it's a resource room when I went and I started to like kind of hate myself because I was like wow you're really stupid and you're really like you're less than all these people and you're all that and it kind of like triggered the anxiety that always was with me to like be at the forefront of my life and like I started to just like overthink everything I did everything I wore everything I said everything everything and it kind of like ate me alive low-key <laughs> like it, I, I feel like it wasn't until COVID that I found myself because I was trapped alone with my own thoughts and my own self so for me COVID was actually a blessing in disguise I hate to say that but you know from my experience with the anxiety and the just the feeling of such self-doubt and like self-hatred COVID kind of brought that out of me <laughs> like it kind of it was a kind of a it was, it was a, a moment of respite more, yeah it was more of a, a pause. pause it was a pause, yeah. a pause. I, I do have some clients who experienced it that way yeah mm -hmm. um sort of like a turning inward a pause especially teenagers because the social pressures can be so yeah. enormous that to be able to take a pause and just focus inward focus on school what i want to be doing yeah who am i Exactly. Yeah. And like for, for Bronxville, another thing is like going to college is like really important in Bronxville. Like 
go into an, uh, an Ivy or like a high-end school or whatever. And like, I was not getting into Cornell, you know? Like that was just not my journey. So I, but I felt really pressured to go to a, a college. So I went to college for one, a semester. Go me. Uh, and I went <laughs> for one semester and I had a mental breakdown. <laughs> I was not doing very well. They wanted to put me in a language and I have dyslexia, so English is my second language. Mm -hmm. And I, um, so I just was like really struggling and I kind of, I started to like r even feel more anxious and more like why am I even like here if I can't do the things that like, everyone wants me to do and everyone feels like it is important in this life. And I, then I left college and I took a gap year and I was extremely lost and I felt anxious and nervous and then COVID happened and we were stuck together as a family and it was like, good. A plus. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Can I just say, yes. I, I think what is so great about this generation is that they are so fluent in the language of mental health and anxiety and open. And I come across that when I talk to younger people, that it's natural to talk like this. My generation is, is open, but a little less forthcoming. And we're kind of learning the language. Generation behind me is very unfamiliar with these terms, these concepts. I've come across older folks who don't understand. Well, you just need a rest. Right, they don't understand the enormity well, behind right. it. Yeah. And, it, and worse, you sound entitled. Yeah. Or, um, you know, this is, this is privilege, or this is, you know, your sort of, you, you um, whining and complaining. Just get it together. So, right. right. Just get it together. So the generational differences in how yeah. we talk about this are so evident, but my hope, my optimism comes from this generation yeah. yes. that talks about it very freely. And yeah. that's where we yeah. all need to really get. Mm -hmm. You could see it with a Simone Biles, yes. you know, because there was a lot of response to yeah. her stepping back, yeah. which ended up benefiting other gymnasts, yeah. you know. It, it, other it, people. Uh, you know, the yeah. U.S. still did well. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> but there, you know, I think the public um, was sort of like, well, you've got to buck up. You know, you've got to take oh, off the pressure. I'm sorry, were you sexually assaulted? Like, that's, no. Right. Yeah. That's like, part of these, shut right. up. Like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, there can be a lack of compassion. And then on the other hand, there was a lot of support for her. Yeah. Right? Um, so I think people respond differently. You know, it's it upsets me to hear you say that there was stigma around yeah. learning issues mm -hmm. at school. Um, and, and I do, you know, I work with local teens and um, children and, you know, it, it is hard to encourage them, even the young ones, to get the help that they need. Yeah. So one thing to note, and I don't know if it was this way when you were there, but I know that um, my son is doing some skills stuff and I think that's the resource room. Yeah, that's, that's like resource, resource 2.0. <laughs> um, and they have worked very hard actually to make the transitions, yeah. the physical transitions out of the class or whatever actually quite discreet. So yeah, I don't know if that, awesome. that may have been because of you. Good job. Yeah, no. <laughs> um, so SE, for you, um, when you talk about, you know, one of the reasons why I asked you here tonight is because I was watching you on social media um, really present what was happening to you in real time. So I'd love for you, for you to kind of finish your story of where you went and what happened. Well, the good news in what happened to me was that it was so abrupt and debilitating, I knew I needed help right away. It, it was not prolonged. When I had a mental break, it was severe. Um, for like 72 hours, I couldn't read, I couldn't watch TV, it was hard for me to make decisions at the grocery store. Um, I cried all day for 72 hours and I knew I couldn't function. So I got help right away. I got a therapist, I started a medication course, um, I met with a number of therapists multiple times a week and I took time off work right away. Um, and that uh, definitely helped. But sharing what I was going through really helped, too, on a number of levels. One, having people like Naomi Osaka, Simone Biles, Meghan Markle, I had covered their mental health stories, and I had been writing about them and sort of defending them against idiots who wanted to blame them for their mental health issues. Um, having covered that, I gained a lot of sort of 
courage and strength watching their public discussions. I'm not sure without them, I, I would have gotten help, but I'm not sure I would have felt okay telling my employer I need time off for mental health. Um, but so, many, so much changed. I, I, I've been saying 2020 was an awful year for mental health. 2021 was a terrific year because we're struggling, but so many more people are talking about it. Yeah. And so in getting help and talking about it, I mean, my community, my world opened up and I started hearing from Naomi Osaka, oh, from Naomi yeah. Osaka, right. yes. Um, and, and other people about their tips and tricks mm -hmm. and here's what I've done, here's what mm -hmm. I've done. And I start, I start sentences now on Twitter with my therapist says mm -hmm. um, <laughs> to sort of normalize these conversations. And I find so many people are going through so much of the same stuff. And even, if I may, uh, yeah. the National Football League has finally yes. stopped acting like there isn't real issues. So they had, uh, at the Cowboys and Raiders game a couple of weeks ago, they interviewed two of those star players and they talked about their mental health issues and they made it okay. That they is huge. It's huge. Yeah. I huge. mean, for, yeah. because men, a lot of times, that's, I mean, yes. no offense, guys, but they were not always open up to say, hey, we need a problem. Yeah. We have a problem, we need to talk to somebody. Well, and I was just saying today, because I wrote about it, um, Jalen Rose is a former basketball yeah. player, yeah. and Charlemagne the God is a very popular mm -hmm. radio personality. They had a conversation yesterday mm -hmm. about mental health. Right. Two men of a certain age, both men of color, and in communities of color, mental health is even more stigmatized, mm -hmm. um, and the barriers to getting treatment are higher. Mm -hmm. uh, that is an incredible moment. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure that would have happened a couple of years ago. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm curious for you, Essie, in light of being an opinion journalist, that you put out strong thoughts in a positive way, I think, um, and your intention is pure. When you were that vulnerable, putting it out there, um, were the trolls worse in light of recognizing you being sensitive? Trolls got a troll, so the trolls were the same. Yeah. <laughs> um, they didn't you know, double troll? Yeah, that troll, <laughs> might, yeah, no, so they, I mean, the trolls troll. They didn't become good people yeah. suddenly. But I was actually met with a ton of compassion, a ton of mm -hmm. compassion, because I think really what I was going through, even though it was unique as, like, a, from a journalist's point of view, because we see so much, I think what I was experiencing was very normal, um, considering how many of us are battling this. So I got a lot of compassion. But there's always, there's always trolls. I mean, there are very well-known people in media who have giant platforms and who should know better. who are still using them to stigmatize, perpetuate stigmas about mental health and blame people for their mental health struggles. And that's awful. But the more we talk about it, the more educated I think people get and the more normalized these conversations become. Yes. I think also, sorry. Please, go. Yes. I think also something that's like, I love hearing about your story because everyone has like different mm -hmm. things, you know, like different, like my anxiety is different than your anxiety. It's right. different than the other person's anxiety. Like I, I feel like it's important for, because with taking away stigma, we have to realize like, everyone's journey, everyone's like story is different. Yeah. So you can't like judge someone from the, for their reaction of something when you don't know where they're coming from. Because like, I, when I have like really bad anxiety attacks, like I can't really think straight yeah. very well. Like I'm very like what you were saying about like having like, you can't even like decide what you want at the grocery store. Like I totally. can relate to that statement very hard. Mm -hmm. Like you're just like, you're stuck on like a thought loop and paralyzed. stuff. Paralyzed. Yeah. yeah, you're mm -hmm. paralyzed. Yeah. But some people aren't. Like some people are not right. paralyzed. They're like my best friend. She, she said I could do this, so it's like okay that I'm talking about her behind her back. But she, <laughs> you're not she, behind her back. She, yeah, she, she does. Um, she was my roommate for a year, and she has like mental health issues as well. But she deals with it super differently than I do. Like she, her whole way of going about it, she likes to go out. She likes to like kind of release the like everything that mm -hmm. she's feeling throughout the day, she'll like go out and like release it then. Mm -hmm. And like, that's like awesome for her. But like at, at the end of the day, it's like, she's still like dealing with her own mental health problems, yeah. you know? And like she, she can come home and be like, wow, that was like a bad idea. Like I, I shouldn't have done that. I should have mm -hmm. done this instead. You know what I mean? Like everyone has their own way of dealing with things. And like, I feel like 
yeah, the only way to take away stigma is to like understand that everyone deals with it differently and everyone yeah. shows it differently. Yeah. Because like someone normally wouldn't know that that's like her way of dealing with her mental health, but it is, you yeah. know. Yeah. Right. Um, in light of people having their own course, you know, a a amongst um, an individual as a family or a spouse or a caregiver, and. Um, I know that we have a lot of Bronxville parents out in the audience tonight, including Lisa and Joe. Leah, Where are they? Leah. Leah, Leah and Joe. Leah. Hi, guys. Um, so when you think about your parents, um, what can you say that they did right for you in this journey? Well, I think that it's really important, and something that they do really well is being supportive and like along for the ride kind of like mm. don't judge your child off of their like what they're going through because even though you're looking and you're like oh my god like how is my child like this because like I get it sometimes you could be a little wild and like I could say mean things and I could be crankier <laughs> that was my like it's okay mm -hmm. uh, crankier like a little extra um, but they know at the end of the day it's just like my it's like inside of me like I can't con like sometimes I can't control it and like that's what self-soothing like we were talking mm -hmm. about before mm -hmm. is like s soothing techniques and like therapy and stuff like I, I go to a cognitive behavioral therapist which is like very important I think and she basically like breaks down steps for you to like are you mind reading are you like Th are you like mind reading is like thinking you know what someone is else that is your thinking. story are you yeah. telling a story yeah do you yeah know yeah it in truth? do you know yeah 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 and like there's just like different techniques for you to like realize like what you're doing is like am I is, is what I'm saying a little too like irrational you know what I mean like mm -hmm. is what I'm doing am I saying something wrong you know like it's just like good but my parents they have kind of been along for the ride and they're here to like hear me and like not judge me mm -hmm. and they also like wear like a, not, and I hate to say mistakes, because they're not mistakes, because they're only, like, when I was six, it was 2006, you know what I mean? Like, the medication and, like, the, the system at, in 2006 is different than it is now, you know what I mean? Like, I'm on medication now for anxiety, but it's so different and, like, acts differently in me mm -hmm. than when I was six. And the medicine's different, like, you know? Yeah. So they couldn't have known that. They couldn't have known that, like, when I was six, it was, like, too much or whatever. So, like, I think learning about, like, what they did like right and wrong and like being there for the journey is like important you know and like mm -hmm. being long like they'll come with me to like therapy now and like we'll have like an open discussion of the three of us is like how we can like make this relationship better because like sometimes I can be a little anxious and weird and like annoying but like I'm all it's for love you know mm -hmm. so like that's <laughs> they're just along for the ride. Virgil and Jen do you want to add to that? I feel like hearing about your parents and their being here is just I mean, it's so exciting to hear how embraced and loved you feel mm -hmm. and accepted mm -hmm. because I believe that's the whole part of why we're here tonight. We're yeah. here tonight to encourage everyone to be accepting mm -hmm. of everyone's differences but mental health challenges which can present in different ways. And if we are that open and we're compassionate with ourselves, we can be compassionate. But with. I also do feel there is an element of helplessness for oh. somebody who's not experiencing it directly. And I don't know, for you, John's in the audience. What's up, John? Mm -hmm. um, and your dad, mm -hmm. is there you know, anything that you could comment on that in terms of what they could offer you and what they can do and what they couldn't in that time? Well, I had mental health issues um, as a younger person as well. And I think as a parent, that feeling of helplessness, especially if you're a fixer, right? someone who, I, I can solve this. I need to solve this and I will fix it. It's kind of out of your hands. I mean, there's a lot of support and resources, but fixing it isn't a thing. And that could be frustrating for um, spouses, friends, colleagues, parents. But I think once you let go of the idea that you can fix it or that you can even get it, you, you might not ever get what we're going through. That's okay. What I've found to be super supportive, and my whole family's been supportive. Um, you know, my, hu my husband had to learn what my new triggers were. New triggers that ha had never been triggers before, like watching TV, something we always did. Um, doing certain things that were new, he wanted to help, you know, incorporate the new, the new line um, in our lifestyle, and that was, that was helpful. I, I'm sure he didn't understand completely but just being willing mm -hmm. to do what I needed and also not bugging me about it every five seconds. Period. 
How are you feeling? How are you feeling? What's are you going feeling? on today? How are you? What can we do? Is it uh, stop? And he never did that. Thankfully, he always struck such a great balance of checking in, but leaving me alone uh, because that pressure and stress of being checked on all the time. Um, I, for me, it wasn't helpful. Maybe for someone else, it would be. A lot of times with parents that I work with, I ask them to stay with them themselves to look at what they're feeling before they go to their child mm. or go to even their spouse. Because if they're not really checking in with where they are, more than likely, well, how are you doing? How are you doing? But they're not dealing with what are they anxious about. So right. we start with ourselves. And then we, we then know in a different way how we might approach that person. But if we're not dealing with ourselves, we're going to try to get them yeah. Fixed. Handle, yes, yes. Right. fixed. Handle yeah. our, our anxiety. Yeah. 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 Along for the ride is such a beautiful yeah. way to put it. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that that is what loved ones and friends yeah. can do for someone with mental health mm -hmm. issues. I think there are some hard feelings that come over parents sometimes, hard to acknowledge um, and sometimes hard to penetrate. Um, defensiveness mm -hmm. is one, you know. Um, like sometimes when there are mental health problems, people start to blame each other. Um, and, you know, especially children trying to figure out, or teens trying to, or young adults trying to figure out what's going on with themselves, they could end up sort of lashing out at parents, and parents could get defensive. So, sort of trying to be open to what people are telling you about your relationships. And then there's something that hardly anyone talks about, which is shame. Mm -hmm. um, because when there's mental health, uh, mental illness in one's family, and if it's your child, you know, you kind of want to protect them, but you also are thinking about like being in a fishbowl and what that feels like, and people seeing it and, and judging you. Mm -hmm. You know, if they see your child misbehave or, mm -hmm. you know, not make it, yeah. right? Um, do you get judged? And therefore, do you push your children further than where they can go? So there are a lot of hard feelings, I think, that come along with um, having someone in your midst, in your family, who struggles. Yeah. Something that might, sorry, just yeah, another, because this is just speaking upon, something else that like, I think is really important and has changed kind of like that dynamic of like the way I kind of speak to my parents and like the way, I'm also like older, I'm 21 now, but like this was when I was like younger. I used to be a little bit more aggressive about things, but like now that I'm older, at, like tell them what you want from them. That's something my therapist told me to say is like if I'm like coming in to just like vent about like this feeling that I was like been having all day like I'm gonna instead of just like going in and attacking the person with like these feelings that I was having or whatever maybe be like listen I just need you to listen to me for right. five minutes don't while fix I, it yeah don't yeah, just yeah, while yeah. I'm like yeah. scream at you <laughs> but like it's not it's not like it's I don't not mean, you it's not no. you it's right. me yeah. but like it, it is very yeah. productive to have an ask yeah, yeah. like exactly yeah. like saying instead of just going into it being like hey is this okay like can I do this right now and, and you're then, supposed to know what yeah. I need right now yeah exactly. let me just can tell I you ask yeah. you yeah. like not to say these words to me yeah you know can you say it to me in this way I think I'll hear it better if it's like this yeah Exactly. So in the process of these journeys, I think there are moments where you really feel out of control. Um, we've spoken about it. I think everyone's had that. Um, and I'm curious to bring up the idea of faith. And I don't necessarily, I know we're in a church, so certainly faith can be construed in, in a way of prayer or God. But I think if you take it in a more humanistic perspective, there's a moment in the journey where you really feel like everything's out of control. And I want to ask you two, and um, to start with you guys, that you know, somewhere in the process, that person needs to find an anchor hold where they somehow get the ability to change course or make a different decision or realize, have a different realization that sets the course for healing. So actually, why don't I start with you two when you think about your journeys and this more current one for you. Um, where was the anchor point? Were you, things felt a little bit better? Like, what was it, the moment where you said, you know what, I'm going to be okay? I mean, I, I always, I immediately knew and believed I would figure this out. Mm -hmm. And I would go as long as it took to get the help I needed because I loved my family. I was not suicidal through any of this um, chapter. chapter. I wasn't depressed. I wasn't sad. I was anxious and overwhelmed. And so I, I had faith 
that I was going to get it sorted out. I didn't know how long it was going to take. But I didn't know if I'd be able to do my job. Because so many of my triggers have to do with my job. And actually, in sorting through this with my therapist, I mean, we're, we're working on this together. She doesn't know. She can't just tell me, we'll turn off the news. Mm. Yeah, like you can't. I, I can't do that. Yeah. And so we're working together on a way to manage my life and think about um, a new life. She described it to me. She said, you know, athletes get too old to do certain things. They have to retire. <clears throat> doesn't mean they die. doesn't mean they don't do other things. You might be psychologically and mentally and emotionally too old to do what you're doing still. You've been doing it for 20 years. You might need to consider a new chapter. And so I've been thinking about that a lot. And I don't, I don't know if I'm going to believe this completely. But in trying to manage what I currently do in a way that works for me, and I'm lucky to have employers that are, that are helpful with that, I'm also having to face the idea that I might need to open a new chapter, that I might not be able to put myself through this constantly. If I may, forever. see, I think what you also described is where you found your anchor positively was with that relationship with your therapist yeah. who works with you collaboratively. Yeah. It's like he or she, I'm not sure which she. it is, she is with you. And that is, I believe, the best kind of therapy, that the therapist is with the patient. They're right, walking right alongside yes. them. They're witnessing. They're not telling them what to do, not giving advice, unless it's more specific cognitive behavioral, yeah, which they different. are. So I don't yeah. want to, <laughs> yeah. but in this modality where you really feel like you're not alone in this journey. And that is some of the most profound work. I mean, mm -hmm. I feel very, very, very touched when people share yeah. their story with me that I feel honored. Mm -hmm. And I think most of all of my colleagues feel the same way because we do not, I don't do what I do because I read it in a book. I did my own therapy for years. Mm -hmm. That's what I had to do it as a psychoanalyst. I mean, so I've set what people have said. I've laid, lied down where they've lied down because in psychoanalysis. So my point is, is if we are really in that collaborative way, yeah. that's an anchor that we can always have. We she find definitely, it inside. yeah, she definitely has been, and I'm I'm in talk therapy, mm -hmm. which is different, and yeah. what I need. Um, but yeah, I need she opens my eyes mm -hmm. every day, not just about anxiety, but like motherhood and mom guilt and how mm -hmm. to deal with life. Mm -hmm. And when I say I share this on Twitter with you know my followers, the reception I get is just, oh my god, that makes so much sense. Oh my god, it's mm -hmm. so great to hear, and the relief mm -hmm. I get from hearing her tell me. Take it down. Take the pressure off yourself a little bit. I mean, it is emotional mm -hmm. to be told I have permission to do yes. that by someone I really trust. Mm -hmm. So talk therapy for me has been a, an absolute lifesaver. Lori Gottlieb wrote this wonderful book a few years ago. You probably have read it called Maybe You Should Talk to Someone. I highly recommend it. It's a yeah. fascinating, <laughs> wonderful book. Uh, I, she really, really hits it, the nail on the head of how just being with someone, talking to someone, how transformative it can be, because then it's not rattling around in your head. You're able to have someone mirror back to you an acceptance that you might not give yourself. Yeah. Right. And my therapist is very much like, she challenges the hell out of me. Like, oh, excuse me. <laughs> she challenges me, like, really hard. Like, she'll, she'll, like, if I say something that's like, I'll be like, I don't know if I can go on a run tomorrow or whatever. She'd be like, why do you think that? Like, why do you, why really? do you not? Yeah. Like, yeah. Re, like, yeah. like she'll, she'll question what I have to say, which for mm -hmm. me is like really important because I need someone to be like, mm, think about what you're saying uh -huh. right now. You know what I mean? Like, if I just talk and talk and talk and like someone just listens, like that to me is like a different, it's not as helpful, you know? But that's also like, trust, right? Yeah. You've established mm -hmm. trust. I mean, I yeah. have a therapist in my life and we spend a percentage, you know, cracking jokes and laughing or, you know, do what do you think of this? And to the mm -hmm. point that she's like, I think that sucks. Yeah. You know, it's like, yeah. awesome. You know, I, I, I need that. Uh -huh. So, yeah. um, so I would like to actually open up the floor. Um, uh, I'm going to come down with a microphone. And uh, just to be clear, if anybody does have a question, um, it's probably worth saying that Virgil and Jen are not here for specific medical advice. <laughs> um, so please try to I keep your question general. Own. So does anyone? Does anyone have a question um, that they would like to bring up with anyone here? 
Hi. Several of you mentioned the um, occurrence that many more people talked about their mental health issues in 2021 as opposed to earlier, even 2020. And I'm wondering if that has to do with maybe COVID was the iceberg, for the tip of the iceberg for them. And so once they launched it based on the tip of that unjudgmental iceberg, they could then get into what they really needed to talk about. And if that's so, are there other non-judgmental kinds of things that we could advertise that would bring people forward? I, th I think when COVID happened, a lot of people, like this is just like what I feel for my friends as well, like some of my friends who have come forward with like, oh, I'm struggling with depression or something else. Like it's being like isolated with your own self. You kind of realize like, the, the trauma that you've been hiding, you know? And I think that's like why it kind of like was the tip of the iceberg and why COVID kind of like brought to light a lot of mental health issues. Cause I bet a lot of people didn't even know that they had a mental health issue yeah. until they were stuck alone with themselves. <laughs> like, I think that's like- Well, well I, sure. I do think that COVID has um, exacerbated um, things that may have been percolating. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you were mildly you know, low, sad, your depression probably bubbled up. You know, if you were mildly anxious, but making it work, yeah. you know, this caused it to really bubble up, you know? I think what's interesting about the COVID crisis is that everyone is going through it. There's a commonality. And that might invite more people to speak about what they're experiencing and to come clean about it and to like verbalize it because we're all going through it. You know, um, you're not like hidden in a closet. I mean, everyone is, every, everyone is going through it. And I really do have to say that um, I think people with some amount of fame and notoriety stepping forward into the light and saying that they struggle is monumental. Mm -hmm. It's monumental. Yeah. I mean, it really gives people a sense, I'm not alone in it, I don't have to be ashamed of it. Mm -hmm. um, what she's saying sounds really familiar to me. What he's saying, I've been through. Um, so I just think it's monumental. Mm -hmm. uh, going with the water metaphor <laughs> of iceberg, I see it more like the water that is, if you go to Long Island Sound, when the tide is in, you can't see what's underneath it. But it usually, the tide goes out and you reveal all of what's on the bottom. And I feel like that's what COVID did. Yeah. So if we could have, quite frankly, about advertising, if we could have, and this is what's hard, more people to be honest about their own challenges and struggles like tonight, I think it would help so many people. It's very hard for us as the counseling center because we can't ask our patients to advertise us. Mm -hmm. But clearly people have been helped by therapy. And we're not here to, pro you know, so much promote us is promote mental yeah. health awareness. Yeah. Yeah. That's what we want. We want everybody to benefit from this. Yeah, I have to say, Roseanne, the phones are ringing. Mm. People are calling. Oh, yeah. I mean, people are really, you know, feeling the lightning bolt of, of distress. And, and, you know, I'm fielding a lot of calls. Like, I, people are making those calls. Yeah. Um, thank you. I think you've given us some great ideas for um, helping our kids, in my, in my case. Um, one thing that I would love a little bit of help or direction is, a lot of times um, the inquiry to me comes over the phone and it's in the middle of the day when, you know, and, and I'm not expecting it or I'm in the car or I'm, I'm with people or whatever. And I'm just, I, I try and listen to try and detect, you know, how important this is. Do I need to hang up on what, I, what, what I'm doing and, you know, direct my attention over to this one particular, all my kids are in their early 20s. Um, or is this just venting or whatever? And, and I want to always make sure I don't say the wrong thing. So maybe Olivia, if you could yes. tell us maybe what some of the wrong things are. I think some of them are super obvious, but <laughs> not always. And I hear, I'm hearing maybe what you're saying is that we should say to our kids 
what do you need me for right now? Yeah, no, that's like super like important. Like what you just said, like getting a call in the car or something, like I'll do that to my mom. Like I will fully like text her in the middle of the day. I'm, 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 at, I'm, I'm at work and I'm like, I'm, like something's happening, you know what I mean? And like, it's like automatic. But I think, yeah, like that's a perfect thing to be like, what do you need me to be here for you right now? Like what, it, what is my, what do you need me to do for you? But you also like what you said about thinking about yourself, mm -hmm. Like that's so important too because like you both, your mental health is as important as the as your child's mental health, and if it's like I st I kind of started to realize like my mom was getting affected by like me doing these like things or whatever and like being vulnerable and like you know all of that stuff. But it's like completely valid because like I've been this way since I was a child, so it's been like 21 plus years of like me being like this that weighs on a person. So like think about what you like need as well and then like re have an open dialogue o about it like how because if they say something to you that like makes you upset like be like that makes me upset as well you know what I mean don't be afraid my least favorite thing in the world is like people walking around eggshells with people with mental health disorder or whatever or like any type of mental health or just are struggling like they're not delicate. They, they, they are delicate, but they're not like, they want to know, they love you equally. It's, we're all like on the same page here. We're just, I was going to say this earlier, but my, I call my anxiety, his name is Brian, because I named him because it makes me feel better that I'm saying, it's not me, I am not Brian. Brian just lives in my brain and is there. And sometimes he's like, hey girl, hey, like what's up? Like, what's going on with you today? Like how, how about we think about the world getting like blown up? Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's just like random. And I think it's important to like, know that it's not them. It's just Brian being annoying and like, mm -hmm. it's not their fault. It's just, you know, so I think just having compassion for them and like what you said is beautiful. Like, what do, I, what do you need from me right now? Yeah. And also putting on your oxygen mask. Right? Yeah. First. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> mm -hmm. Hi, Olivia. I just want to tell you, thank you for, for sharing your story. It's very courageous of you and I give chapeau back to you and, and to your parents. You talk about the Bronxville School. As a parent of, uh, of two boys in the Bronxville School, you know, college admissions, there's so much pressure on these kids, so much pressure, I feel, yeah. to get into the right college, to do the right sports. Yeah. And I wanted to ask you, you know, it, as a parent, you know, I have um, uh, girlfriends that have kids in college, and, you know, when I was talking to them, all they talk about when they were getting into the kids into college, it's all they would talk about, the college admission process, and that's, I'm like, Guys, I haven't even, can we talk about something else? I haven't seen you in like yeah. a year. So I wanted to know as a parent, how do you balance, you know, trying to get your kids in the, in, in the right direction? My kids are boys, knuckleheads still. Yeah. How do you make them do the right thing and, you know, study, but not totally obsess about it? And yeah. I always wonder, like, are the parents living vicariously through the kids' college <laughs> admission, you know? Like, how do you, how does, how does one, you know, it's, it, how do you, yeah take out the white noise about this. I think this. it's like all about the individual child's like desires and like aspirations and stuff. Like I did not know mine. I honestly sometimes still don't know mine because of like Bronxville's like just nature, you know? Because like I was so, con like I was so sure of like just getting good grades, getting to a school, like blah, blah, blah. I didn't even finish college. Like I, and I have a great job and like I really like my job. Need. Anyway, I, <laughs> I like really like my job and all that stuff, and I'm at a place that I'm happy, and I honestly didn't even need to go to college, like for what like my aspirations are, or, like and I'm doing. But I think it's all up and like just ask them. Be like, do you? I also did not take the ACT or SAT, and I got into all four of the schools that I applied to. So they weren't like the biggest schools in the world, but like one of them was the new school, like Hofstra, like all these schools that like do not need, you don't need to take the ACT or SAT. And so I think it's just like kind of about the kid, like if they don't like sports, like don't go to a school that's a sports school. If they like musical theater, like go to a musical theater school, like do what you love because in the long run, you're gonna be unhappy if you go to a school and like do these things that you don't want to do and aren't a part of your journey. But if your journey is being that like extracurricular, not extra, I mean academic kid 
who like loves school and goes to school, then do that. You know what I mean? Just like kind of follow your heart. And, like, Olivia, also heart. to interject and maybe to Virgil's point um, that I think a parent has to examine their role in it. Yeah. How disappointed are you if your kid doesn't graduate from college? Yeah. And that's your problem. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I think that's important to, oh, yeah, your question was kind of about parents and I didn't say anything. Anyway, parents. I think it's like, take yourself out of it. You know what I mean? Like, my parents honestly did not care about what school I went to, if I went to school, like the whole time they were like, you do what you need to do, but because of my anxiety and my own self, I was like, no, but everyone around me, all these kids my own age, all these things, they're doing these things, so I have to too. Like in my personal like um, journey, my parents didn't have that like effect on me, like they really didn't mind what my journey was. But if you have that like white no noise that you said, like honestly, like tell them to shut up. Like they don't have, like it's not your kid. Like why do you care so much about what my kid is doing? Like they're happy. You know, I think it's really important to just be happy in life instead of like worrying about what everyone else is doing and what they're you know, up to. When, when I talk to teenagers who are having, you know, struggles sort of measuring up, you know, I, I try to use imagery of like running a marathon. And if you're pacing yourself properly and if you're paying attention to your race and your time, the kind of time that you can run, and not looking side to side to see whether you're keeping up with their time. You know, every time you look sideways, you're sort of losing your pace, you know? And, and so it's, it's kind of important as a parent to encourage your child to just run their race and for you to also know what kind of race they can run, right? So to know your child, um, to know what their interests yeah. are, um, you know, like a traditional college might, it yeah. was obviously yeah. not, not the right choice for you, but AMDA was. Yeah, I went to you know, AMDA. We, we had a whole conversation yeah. about Stephen Sondheim before yeah. we came out here. <laughs> um, you know, if you know your child's interests, their abilities, um, how fast they can go, yeah. um, you can help them sort of strike balance. Yeah, lean into it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. help them find themselves. Find, and find yeah. joy. Yeah. Joy. Yeah. You know, teenagers need joy, mm -hmm. you know, just like we do. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and next question. Yeah. Thank you so much for this uh, evening. So, I don't, I, mine is not really a question, but I would like to say that, of course, as a foreigner in Bronxville and in New York City, I would say that I can, I can see the pressure that these kids are uh, immersed to. And, uh, what is beneficial to me is to, re to see other kids coming from a different part of the world that they still have a normal life, they will go to school. And I often tell my kids that there is a school for everyone and there is a space for everyone and uh, maybe it's not gonna be here, it's gonna be someplace else, but it's beautiful, and uh, what uh, I really would like that my kids see that beauty, that it's, it's not everything in a grade or how successful you are. It doesn't matter. And in fact, today I was walking and I see other kids playing in a, a sport, and uh, so oftentimes I was pushing myself, why, pushing my kid, why you don't do that? Why? And I would think, why am I pushing him? If he doesn't like it, if he doesn't want to do it, that's his life, that's his time. Yeah. It's his choice. And if he wants to, you know. You know, I, I think there's also some amount of modeling mm -hmm. that we can do for our yes. children, mm -hmm. you know, and the people around us. I mean, if we condemn ourselves for dropping balls or, you know, losing out on opportunities or not being like the height of excellence and everything mm -hmm. that we do, our children will probably mm -hmm. hold themselves to the same standards. So, I mean, the more we can model patience, tolerance, acceptance with ourselves, mm -hmm. with our spouses, you know, um, I think the more likely our children are to do that for themselves. Mm -hmm. And also just, um, I'm learning this as a mom of a relatively young kid, he's six, um, my therapist says, uh, to model my anxiety. 
in age-appropriate ways. Yeah. She said, let me ask you something. Are you, do you hide your anxiety from your son? I said, of course. He said, of course. She said, don't do that. He can't grow up thinking you're perfect and you've never had challenges or you know the answer to every question. What he needs is to see that you've, again, in age-appropriate ways, he doesn't yeah. need to see me sobbing in the corner, but yeah. um, <laughs> True. You know, he needs to see that you've had challenges, that you've gotten help, that you've talked openly about things, that you don't have every answer. Be anxious and talk to him about how you're working on it. Um, that was hugely important for me to hear as a mom, that I don't need to shield him from this. And see, how did that play out when you did it? How did that play out? Can you give me an example, explain what his face was like or how he commented when you actually did that? Well, it's such a relief to tell him, you know, Jack, I don't have the answer um, to solve this problem at school, but let's work on it. We'll keep talking about it. We'll talk to people who might have the answer. I don't have to be perfect because I'm not trying to raise a perfect child and he won't know how to be imperfect. Mm. If all I model is, I've got it. I've got it all. I'm a mom, I'm super mom. And what my therapist said was, be, be a good enough mom, mm -hmm. not a perfect mom. That right. will show him how to be a normal person and not feel ashamed of having issues and to talk about them. So that's something I think my generation is learning right now, how to, model our own issues and raise a generation that is no longer um, afraid or ashamed of them. Uh, but I just found it incredibly relieving. And to me, yeah. the essence of that is that Essie is taking responsibility in her work on herself with what she feels, as opposed to trying to deal with her anxiety so she shields her son and then he pays uh, a price for that. She's owning yeah. and he and modeling that she takes responsibility for her feelings. Mm. And if we all did that, we could always be perfect. To me, it's about that. Whether we're parents or our spouses, is how we take responsibility for what we feel, because yeah. they're not making us feel that way. We feel that. And yeah. if we do that, we're doing it up. We're halfway, three quarters of the way there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right? Yeah, I agree. Got a question. I'm interested, uh, this is for the whole panel. Um, how do you find a good therapist, a good match? And when might it be time to find someone new? Maybe you've been working with someone for a while and you're thinking, ah, there's just a feeling that I need to find someone new. And I'd love to ask Essie and Olivia your perspectives and then, and then Jen and Virgil maybe for theirs. Why don't you start? Okay, I have been with the same therapist for a while now, um, since I was like 16. But before then, I was like had a rotation kind of of like a bunch of different uh, people and like different things because I you really need to try it out. You need to know what's like good for your style because I used to lie to my therapists because that's because uh, like they would be sitting there and they'd be like, oh, that really that sounds. Oh, yeah. Like, uh huh. Like they were just like kind of they wouldn't help me in any way. They kind of were just like there to like hear what I was going through. And for me, that's just like not what I need from a therapist, but like some people do need that. Like that's important to them, but that's just like, for me, I need someone to like challenge me. And so- An active participant. Yeah, yeah. like an, a yeah, exactly. Like just, yeah. So, and I think there's also, you need to, what's really important is finding a good psychiatrist. Cause if you want to be medicated, you don't want to be on that like, <laughs> Xanax or something, you know what I mean? You want to be on like the right prescription mm -hmm. for you and the right like percentage because like mm -hmm. when we start when I was started COVID I was I had too high of a like uh, Pill like whatever dose. 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 Thank dose. You. Yeah. <laughs> a dose. Thank you. My brain. Uh, I had too high of a dose, and it was like literally I was sick. I was like ill from yeah. this medication, and it wasn't until because my anxiety wasn't as bad, it like wasn't doing what it needed to do. Mm -hmm. So I went to a new psychiatrist, and she was like, "Oh, you need that's like not right for you." So then she like helped me, and so I think psychiatrist is as important as therapist, mm -hmm. but just like different. I see. Um, I think the first thing you have to think about. Um, is you want to run through the process, right? When you're going through, you want to run. I want to get to the finish line of feeling great, back to normal, got the right care, got the right medicine, walk. You're going to walk it. And if you set expectations that you might have to go through several therapists, several different kinds of medications, I think that's very helpful to, to know in the beginning. 
Second is to know what you want out of a therapist. And hopefully a therapist helps you identify that. But do you want um, a, a challenging back and forth? Do you want to be kind of given direction and guidance? Do you want an ear? Um, I, needed, I needed a couple things. I needed talk therapy from someone that I really trusted. And I know that it's working because I leave every session exhilarated with the new things I'm going to try or um, the relief I just got. I mean, I, I don't know if everyone feels that, but that's what I you know, would look for, that feeling of relief or excitement. I'm, 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 you know, um, I'm looking forward to addressing these challenges. And then I also needed someone to prescribe medication that I trusted. And I found, I mean, it's like dating. It, it, um, really, is. Like, it really is like dating. Like, so what I want from my talk therapist is not what I want from my prescribing the therapist. It's not. And she is, um, I'll just tell a really quick funny story. Yeah. She is this vaguely Eastern European, I'm not sure, um, brilliant doctor. She has a very thick accent, and it's awesome. And she's very blunt. And she'll say, I, so she oh, first yeah. prescribed Zoloft, and I got a huge rash. Ooh. So I had to go off of that, and she goes, OK, I have another. It's <laughs> great. And 98% of clients love this. 2%, not so much. <laughs> I said, OK, what, the 2%, what didn't they like? What, you know, what should I be aware of? She goes, well, 2% say it make them homicidal. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. I said, what? She said, Fill them with rage, want to go on rampage. And I said, well, I'll watch out for that, I guess. But that's the kind of bluntness I need it. Because now I trust you. I trust you completely that you're going to give it to me straight. And um, this medication did not make me homicidal. Uh, it so far. Beautifully, so far. Uh, but, but it, you know, finding those personality, um, the chemistry, that's it. There's no right, this is going to you know, be the one for you. You have to feel it. It's, it really is like finding a mate. Yeah, no, for sure. Also, I love that you said it's like a walk. Like, you, you can't, walk it. there's also no finish line. I just want you to know right. that ahead of time. You're like, never done. You're never done with it. It's a, it's a journey, like, because, like, I, again, I was six years old when I started, like, getting shit chucked at me. So I, like, no. <laughs> like, it's, it doesn't, it's not going anywhere. Like, Parents, I, I gave her yeah. permission to swear today. Yeah, yeah. she did. She, <laughs> did. I told her she, she did ask. <laughs> I asked. That was nice. I said she could. Blame it's me. just, like, a part of me. Like, I can't not. Anyway. I uh, said sometimes it's the right word. It's the right word, like, just for me. Anyway, there's, I just feel like there's no finish line and that there is, it's an ongoing journey and there's going to be ups and downs but at the end of the day like it's a walk it's yeah. not a run yeah. I, I would say when it comes to choosing a therapist um, describe yourself as honestly and as well as you can right. when you're speaking to a possible prospective therapist um, because the the more they can understand what you're looking for, what you're struggling with, the more they can let you know whether that's their wheelhouse. Um, also, I would say use your intuition. I mean, people often say to me, I, I like the sound of you, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. and, and I don't know exactly what it is, you know, that mm. they're liking, but they like it, you know? And then sometimes they don't. And, as a therapist, and I'm sure Virgil will agree with me, I do not feel defensive or insulted when someone decides they want to go somewhere else. I'm happy for them, actually, mm -hmm. that they're advocating for themselves and making good choices. Mm -hmm. You know, and that, and that they're putting themselves out there. It is a little like dating. Yeah. You know, put, like, you, you just have to get out there and seek the help, and, and don't necessarily wait till it's a crisis point. Um, you know, try and, like you do with other, you know, aspects of your uh, physical health, your body, you know, try to read the signals that you need something before it's a crisis. This way you can sort of take a measured approach um, and find the person who's your best match. And I also want to say that at different junctures in your life, you may need different things, yeah. right? I mean, at some junctures, um, you may need pharmacotherapy. Sometimes you um, grow out of that and you're like, I'm, like, I'm feeling good, I'm gonna try it without medication. Sometimes you need relationship therapy, like bringing your parents in and yeah, working right. stuff out. 
Sometimes you need marital therapy, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so there's just all different points in your life um, where you might need something different. And no therapist who's worth their salt is going to be insulted um, when, when you make that choice. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's great. Um, we are actually out of time. So, but here's, of course, you know, I'm gonna get, well, we have the two parents here, but go ahead. <laughs> probably, um, like us, had a child at six years old, and they're not choosing their own therapist, you are. So I just wanted oh, to um, tell you that you should start with your pediatrician and talk to your pediatrician about what's going on with your child, and oftentimes they recommend, or your school psychologist. So there's like another place to start, too, if you have young children. It's not the same Good. as choosing your first no valid. Um, therapist valid. and Good psychiatrist. Advice. and. You know, the times to change are when you become an adult, too, yeah. because there are things that change in your own life, and actually you realize who you are. So anyway, I just want to add that. Good advice. Um, so we actually have um, some drinks in the Edwards room, which is right through here. I encourage you all to come and say hello That's to yeah. these, so cute. Yeah. I was going to say four panelists, but now no, I'm going to say five. Oh, Virgil, Jen, Olivia, Essie, and Brian. <laughs> um, and we are deeply... Bring Brian. I'm so glad he's here, by the yeah, way. No, I'm not kicking him out. He's here all day, all okay. time. <laughs> I want to sincerely thank you all for making the effort. I truly believe that the more that we do this, the more we normalize it. And I hope that you guys will have repercussions from this. Um, I know that the Counseling Center has a lot of clients, so I don't, if, uh, if they can't see you when you decide to see a therapist, I'm sure they can refer Please you. Please do call yeah, us. We call. will always yeah, be able to try to accommodate or know someone we can refer. So that that's not about don't call us. We need to make sure you know that we're a resource here and then you know, the wider community. Yeah, a great place yeah. to start. Yeah. Let's give a round of applause. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Can we de mic? Just right through here if you'd like to have a drink. Can Turn we de mic? Your mic's off. Yeah, yeah. Let's